Good morning. How's everyone feeling? Good. I feel like a teacher. Um, hopefully, I'm not going to be like a teacher. Uh, re really, what I want to do is have a conversation with you, lots of backwards and forwards, where you ask me things about some of the things I spoke about last night. Um, but we had a bunch of subjects to start with, so maybe if I kick it off and then if I start to flag, you can throw another subject in, we can talk about that, and um, I'll tell you what I think and you can tell me what you think. So, one of the things that was definitely on the list of things that Sally wanted me to talk about was social media, so it might be worth sharing a little bit of my experience with that. So, forgive me, the, the images are just background, they're just to, make you, to give you something to look at, hopefully it won't be too distracting, and they'll stop turning in a moment anyway. So, six years ago, six years ago, three days ago, I um, was persuaded by a friend to put some pictures onto Twitter. Um, by the way, who does Twitter? Put your hand up if you do Twitter. Okay, about half of you. Okay, I didn't know there'd be that many. Um, what I thought about Twitter was unprintable at that time. I thought it was Kim Kardashian talking about her bottom and all that sort of nonsense. I was just like, what the hell is this crap? I don't have time for this. I've got work to do. I've got like juggling three jobs. Why do I want to be telling people about my life? Um, and there was another reason why I didn't want to do Twitter, which is my family are deeply private about what we do. Partly for a fear of showing off, which I think is true in a lot of rural communities. You're a little bit nervous about sort of showing off in front of your neighbors or pretending that what you do is great. Um, and I think the, the biggest thing in my mind was respecting my parents who were deeply private. I thought my dad's, my dad's gonna freak out if he knows that I'm like putting pictures of our farming on. Um, so I did what all cowards would do, which is I did an anonymous Twitter feed. And it didn't sit, so it doesn't say who I am. And I basically put some pictures on of uh, some lambs being born, just as like an experiment. I'm like, what the hell is this? But let's put some pictures on anyway. And, and then I, I left my phone in the house and went to do something else. And when I came back later in the day, I think something like 700 people had clicked like the like button on the pictures of the lambs. And that was a bit of a light bulb moment for me. I was like, what the heck is this? W which 700 people are remotely interested in this? What's going on here? And more than them clicking like, I had about 50 questions. What, what are these sheep? How are they born? Um, are they in danger? There's a whole bunch of questions ranging from, the, ranging from the slightly dumb to the really interesting. And I started out, just maybe because it's the kind of person I am, I started out answering these questions. So I would fire back some simple answers. This is the breed of sheep. This is what's happening. Um, quite quickly, I was addicted to this. I thought, oh, hang on a minute. I've always wanted to talk to the public and tell them what they're wrong about or what they don't understand. Uh, so I started really, really enjoying it. And one of the things I was scared of was sharing the reality of the farm. So to be perfectly honest, if you have a livestock farm, I saw yesterday going around Iowa, the truth is if you keep livestock, you have dead stock. That's the expression that we have. Things die. Preferably as few things as possible, but things die. Do you really want everyone to see your dead pigs outside your shed or the lamb that dies? Not really if you're a farmer. You're absolutely terrified quite often that the media would jump on that. And he'd be like, oh, look at these farmers. They don't look after their animals properly and all the rest of it. So I was worried about that. So for about six months, maybe a year, I did this anonymously. All the time I was doing it anonymously, I kept getting uh, messages from people I knew saying, who are you? This, this mountain looks a little bit familiar. <laughs> uh, as some of my friends in the neighboring town were like, it must be one of three or four people because there's only three or four people graze sheep on that mountain. And there's like this whole, whole intrigue to do with it about being anonymous. I hadn't really done it tactically, but um, what I discovered was people were really curious about the idea that you were anonymous. And um, so what, what can I tell you that's useful about social media? If you have a really happy, well-balanced life, you're already really busy, you don't need to communicate with anybody and you don't need to sell anything, don't bother. Okay? This is not a thing that you have to do, have to do for the sake of your life. Um, but if you have a sort of mi some sort of mission, whether it's a financial mission or a communication mission, and you really, really want to talk to a bunch of people and you want to build an audience, then it's a good idea. The problem is, the problem certainly if you're trying to sell stuff on social media, is people aren't, people don't love being sold stuff. Yeah? If you just go on every morning and tell them how great your grain cereal is, that's a little boring after the 56th day, isn't it? Yeah? What people really want from that is uh, some kind of story, some kind of narrative that they can follow. So if you're sharing the story of a pig farm, people, people want to follow the life process of the pig. They want to know about the pigs being born and what you do to keep them alive. Maybe they want to know about some tricky issues like antibiotic use on pig farms. 
Uh, they might even, when they, they, they come to trust you and you dare, share with you the negative side of it. The morning when you go in and there's three pigs dead or tornado trashes your field of wheat or whatever it is. But they need story. So I do share and discuss complicated issues and difficult issues on there now, but less so in the early days when I was building, building audience, I think the marketers call it. Um, and what I try to do even now is I try to keep it about 80-20. So I know that probably 80% of the reason why people follow me is they want a beautiful picture in the morning. They wake up in Manhattan or Bombay, Bombay or wherever it is, and they want a little bit of my, the beauty of what I'm seeing, the snow, the dogs, the sheep. So the rules on my Twitter account is I never appear on it. You can go back through my 20,000 tweets. I don't think I'm on there. Never. Why? Because I don't think I'm the, I'm the object of interest. People are really coming for the landscape, the sheep, the sheepdogs, and the story of that landscape, its history and its culture. Which leads me to another thing, which is one of the biggest mistakes people do when they're, there's two big mistakes you can do. One is to try and sell people things all the time or lecture them. They don't like that very much. Um, the other is to be undisciplined. Okay? So you need to think about why people come to your Facebook page or why they come to your Twitter account. Because I know they come to my account for those three or four things, the dogs, the landscape, the sheep, I keep it to that. I try to keep it to that, okay? Occasionally I have a, I have a political opinion or I see something in the news that irritates me and I speak about it, but if I do that all the time, I'm kind of breaking the deal with the people that follow me. They didn't come for all that. They came for the picture of the beautiful meadow. They came to learn about farming. They came to learn about sheep. So I call it fire discipline. It's a little bit like being in the military. You don't start letting the gun off in all directions. You need to be very, very clear what you're shooting at and keep it focused on that. Um, and the other thing I'd say about social media, which is really good for farmers and really good for writers, is that it's kind of brutal. People's attention span is very, very short. It is a very, very good educator in what you can keep people interested in, particularly as it had the sort of 140 characters limit. I know they've extended it, but uh, it makes you very good at getting your point across in the fewest possible words. And the thing that I really built my account around, more by accident than design, but it kind of works, is the images. People really want to see what you can see, and it's a cliche, but a picture speaks a thousand world, words. So your rural life of whatever life it, kind of rural life it is, is, is something they'll never get to experience. So what you're really offering them, if you're like me, is some kind of connection to the world that they've lost. You're giving them a chance to do that. And I didn't realize how powerful this was till I ended up in places like Manhattan, and you're talking to like some lovely old lady in the queue, she has a book signed, and she says, the first thing I do every morning is look to see what's happening on the farm. I live in this really ugly place in the sort of middle of one of the world's biggest cities, and it's my little moment where I escape, and I can be that kid that thought they were gonna be a farmer's wife one day, or whatever it is. She can have that moment. And what becomes quite funny when you have a lot of followers is they sort of feel like they own me, okay? <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I don't tweet for a little while, or I'm in a grumpy mood or something, they start telling me off. They're like, you're better than that, James, be nice. Yeah. Or, um, or where have you gone? Or why have you not shown us the puppies? So, yeah, dear God, please don't let the puppies be born until I get back. Uh, um, so, so people love that basic stuff, yeah? They really, don't want to be, they really don't want to be lectured. And I think there's a real temptation if you're a farmer, because we have a lot of frustrations, right? We're in the middle of nowhere doing our thing. Um, it's really tempting to just want to tell people. You, know, you people are crazy, you don't pay enough for food, you people are voting for the wrong people, whatever it is. People don't want to be lectured. They want sort of something sort of nicer that carries them along. Okay. Bear with me. The next thing on my list is sheepdogs. Actually, let's stop for a moment. Does anybody want to ask me any questions about social media? Okay, so first off the lady at the back and then second up the lady with the pink or orange top on top. Okay, so the question is, how long do I spend on Twitter, and how often do I tweet, and uh, is it always, are there always words attached? No. There's, there's basically three options on Twitter, which is you can send just words, you can send just pictures, or you can send a combination of the two. If I wake up and I'm in a grumpy mood or I'm too busy and I only have five seconds, I just take a picture, press two buttons, and it goes on. I don't have to put anything else on there today, tomorrow, next, for the whole week if I don't choose to. It's, it's up to you. Um, I find people do like a sort of relatively regular top of the, uh, certainly once a day seems to keep people really happy. It keeps them coming back, it becomes part of their routine. So 
Uh, if I'm not in a very talkative mood, I'll just post pictures. I think I once went a month where I never put any words on. I just shared pictures until some ver very nice but slightly fierce old lady said, we're not children, start telling us what's happening. <laughs> and I thought, okay, but maybe, uh, maybe I've been a bit selfish. I'll start telling, put, putting words with the pictures. So you can choose. You can do it. Uh, yeah, so I've just done a month, a month where I didn't put anything on. I thought, I need to freshen up. It's Christmas. I've got my kids to look after. It's the middle of winter. I'll just freshen up for a month. I haven't put anything on. When I'm, when I'm really in the mood and something amazing is happening or the weather's beautiful or the work's interesting, I'm, I might put 20 tweets on. So how do I do that? Well, when I'm feeding my sheep, I might think, wow, that looks amazing. I just hold my phone up, two clicks, I take a picture. Maybe it's because I can take photographs, I don't know. I think it's just because the landscape looks good and I've got to, like everyone else now, have a sort of smartphone. And uh, I can either do that immediately if I've got good phone coverage signal, or what I tend to do is when I go back to the house for my lunch, I'll spend five minutes when I've just had my lunch, I'll sit in a chair, just having a breather, and I'll tweet two or three things. And then I maybe forget, forget about it, and I come back at night at 8 o'clock, the kids have just gone to bed, and I've now got like 50 questions from people about the picture I put on at lunchtime. So you can just fit it around what you're doing. But it's really about storytelling. And the truth is some people are good at that, and some people aren't good at that. And, and social media is quite brutal at deciding whether it's interested in you or not. So you may find quite quickly that people aren't interested. They're not following. And the hardest bit, to be blunt, is getting the first few hundred followers. Okay? So to be perfectly honest, now that I have 100,000 followers, I can, have a, I can put a pretty lousy tweet on and 200 people would like it. Yeah? If you're starting out, you're going to be really lucky to get 20 people like it because it just isn't being seen. It's not appearing in anybody's thing. So it's quite hard work to get it up and running to a decent level where it would change anything. And the nice thing for me is now if I, if I tell people about an amazing place I've been or I tell people about an amazing book I've read, I get feedback from like the publishers saying like 400 people bought that book in the 24-hour period after you tweeted about it, which, which in book terms is kind of, kind of crazy and really nice that people would listen to it. So to be, to be blunt, if I tweet about something that you, some of you have grown or packaged, you'll probably have a small s spike in sales tomorrow. But if you tweet about it and you're just starting out without the numbers, you're not going to see much effect. You'd be lucky if you persuade one person. So it's, there's a little bit of investment of time and effort to get to a point where you're making any real difference if you're doing it for commercial reasons. But my, my, my goal wasn't commercial. It was just a sort of in intellectual exchange of ideas and things. It was only much later that I began to realize that people were contacting me through it to buy my sheep or the things that I produce. And this last year, 90% of the sheep that I sold, the breeding sheep, were sold at a good premium to people that contacted me through Twitter because they identify me as a person who breeds good, a good version of those sheep or they've seen my sheep on Twitter and they think, on my small holding, on my small farm, I'd like those kind of sheep. That's the guy that does it. I'll contact him on Twitter. That's a little bit unfair to the other 200 people that breed those sheep who aren't on Twitter, but you know, we all do the best we can and take the advantages we've got, don't we? Okay. Any other, sorry, there was another question, wasn't there? What have you posted about being here in Iowa or at Deerfield? <laughs> okay, I, that's a good question. So what have I posted about uh, being at Practical Farmers of Iowa or being in Iowa? Yesterday I tweeted a picture of some of the farmland, sort of intensive farmland down the road, and I said, Iowa's flat, in brackets, uh, the startling geographical insights are free. And about 200 people from Iowa said, it's not flat, you muppet. Uh, yeah, you, uh, the, there's lots of hills, you've only been to the flat bit. So, yeah, every, every day is a school day. Um, and then uh, this morning I put a picture on, you maybe saw last night, I took a picture of you all at the potluck last night, having a great time, and it's just a room full of people, it's really buzzy and nice. Wasn't it nice? Yeah. yeah. So all credit to everybody that did all the work. Uh, and I just basically put on that I'd been to a potluck, it was the first one I'd ever been to, and it was great to see so many people interested in farming, particularly sustainable farming, and so many young people. So, um, who's interested in that? I don't know. We'll have a look at Twitter in about an hour's time, and maybe people will be interested, maybe they wouldn't be. Um, yeah, so I think there's another, another hand up over there. Okay, why Twitter? For me, complete chance. I, I didn't like any social media when I started out doing it. It just happened, the friend I was talking to told me that Twitter would be a, a useful thing for me to look at. I think it suits me. I like the brevity. I like the 140 characters rule because I like words and I'm a sort of writerly person. I really like the discipline of that. You know, can I, can I get a quite complex point across in 140 words? 
Uh, some other people um, might want to do a more visual account with less words. Maybe Instagram's better, better for that. Uh, sorry, yeah, Instagram or Pinterest is better for that. Um, a lot of my friends, uh, certainly the local tweeting between farmers where I live and selling between farmers where I live is on Facebook. So we have lots of Facebook buy and sell groups where I live, where people are selling the sheep backwards and forwards, or they're selling cattle, or they're selling farm machinery. You have the same thing here? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it depends, depends what you want to do. So if I want to chat to people locally to where I live about some issue locally, I might talk to them on Facebook. I don't do a lot of Facebook, but, but if I want to talk to uh, sort of people around, around the world in a wider sense, I use Twitter. I also, uh, the other advantage I think of Twitter is it's, it's quite good at getting to a, sort of opinion formers or politicians or journalists. A lot of those kind of people are on there. And I discovered quite quickly that um, if you send a letter or you send an email or you try and call your local politician, you're going to be really lucky to get any kind of response. If you tweet in front of tens of thousands of people that your local politician isn't doing enough about farming, um, and hundreds of people join in criticizing that person, you get an answer by dinner time. Yeah? From the politician, usually desperate to not look like a, a mug in front of that audience. So the, the bigger you can grow it, the more p power it has. And of course, power can be abused, and you have to be responsible with that. But OK, any other questions about social media before we OK, the lady there? Pardon? Why did I go on Instagram? Why did I go on Instagram? I think as an experiment just to play with it. And at the risk of sounding cynical, I was thinking, I was reading things saying that Twitter was not the thing of the future, and maybe Instagram was. I thought, okay, maybe just as like an insurance policy, I'll run an Instagram account. And that, the truth is I put much less effort into the Instagram account. I don't put the words on the Instagram account. I just share some of the images. And I kind of like that. A whole bunch of other people are on Instagram, so I've made other friends and other contacts through, through that. I think one of the things I really like about Instagram is it becomes a place, sometimes in a bad way, but often in a good way, where people discuss things. I really like, if, so if there's a discussion about tillage, for example, or there's a discuss, discussion about biodiversity in meadows, you end up in these great conversations where there's a few people who don't really know what they're talking about shouting at everybody, sort of in a silly way, but there's really smart people. You, the next thing you know, you're talking to a botanist or you're talking to a, an artist or somebody like you in America that's doing the same thing. I, I quite like that. And one of the best things is behind the scenes, you can have what's called direct mail messages. So maybe you've had a public exchange with this botanist guy who knows more than you do about hay, or woman who knows more than you about hay meadows, that you can carry it on in private. So I, I, can, I can say, look, I don't, I don't know about this other thing. Can, do you want to come to my farm and tell me about it? So I quite like picking up some of those conversations and running with them. OK. Is that enough social media? Should we move on? OK, let's do sheepdogs. Um, Sheepdogs are basically the single most important tool that I have on the farm. And uh, about five years ago, I realized, yet yeah, another thing that my family I've been wrong about, we weren't very good at training sheepdogs. Here's this thing that no farmers will tell you. Most farmers are not very good at training sheepdogs. Yeah, I don't know whether many of you have seen many farmers working sheepdogs, but there's quite often a lot of shouting and cussing and, <laughs> and, and, and dog hiding under the tractor or... or a wife in tears walking off with beloved dog across the field because husbands just swore at it. Or there's all that, all that stuff going on. Um, and my, my dad and me were the same as that. And then about five years ago, we had a friend who bred brilliant border collie sheepdogs, a guy called Paul Chester. And um, I could tell he was reluctant to let me have one of his brilliantly bred sheepdogs. And I realized what the problem was. He didn't think we were going to train it properly. So um, I, I persuaded Paul that if he gave, gave me one of these very well-bred sheepdogs, I would make a much better effort than we ever had before. So I did what all uh, traditional uh, ancient farmers do. I went on the internet and bought a DVD called How to Train Your Sheepdog <laughs> uh, by a man called Andy Nicholas, uh, thinking if anybody sees, any of my friends see me watching a, a, a beginner's guide to training sheepdogs, they're going to laugh their head off. So I didn't tell anybody. I just watched this thing. It's well worth a look. I, I, I know Andy online. I've never met. I have no reason to plug his product if it wasn't good. He basically has like a method where how you train the sheepdog. Really simple, broken down into simple steps that anyone can do. And his theory is that there's no such thing as a bad dog. There's just people that don't know how to train them properly. And so I just copy religiously what Andy Nicholas says. And if any of you are trying to tra train a sheepdog, that would be my recommendation. Buy this, buy this DVD. Just work through the steps. It's really smart. So give you an example. What, he has techniques that I'd never really thought about properly. How do you get the dog to go away, which is go right at the far side of the sheep, 
or come by, which is go left at the far side of the sheep. That's a pretty difficult thing to teach a young dog, right? He does something really simple. He builds a round, about the size of this, builds a round pen with hurdles. He puts six or seven sheep in. Uh, and you stand outside the pen, and you put the young dog outside the pen, OK? And as the, as the sheep run that way, the dog goes running around the far side. And if you weren't there, the dog will go round and round and round like a lunatic, OK? But you are there, so you block the dog as it comes down this way, and you force it to go back that way. And as it goes back that way, you say, come by, OK? And as it comes back the other way, you block it, and you send it back the other way, and you say, away. And I, the dog I have called Floss, who's the top dog at my house, uh, well, she's getting a little bit old now. I spent about five minutes doing this with her in a pen. She was so good. She picked it up so quickly. I took the pen down. She could do it in the field, no problem. Right? No, not all dogs are like that. You can spend six, six weeks on this pen thing. But <laughs> something in my brain was like, this dog's smarter than I am. This, uh... <laughs> so I took the pen down. She's brilliant. I never put her in the pen again. But it's just an example. Of somebody smart has a, has a way of doing something that you don't have. Just copy them. Don't be too proud. So. Um, so yeah, uh, so I'm about to start that process again, and with the, the puppies that hopefully get healthy puppies that we hopefully get next week, um, I'll sell some of them as puppies, so, uh, only to people that I trust that will look after them and train them properly. So there's already a waiting list of three or four shepherds want, want puppies from Floss, fathered by Tan. Uh, I'll probably keep two or three of them, and I'll train them for six or eight months using that technique, and I'll pick the absolute best one to join my team, and I'll sell the two next best ones uh, to other people. And, <coughs> and it's, an, it's absolutely amazing. It's like a lot of things, isn't it? When somebody teaches you how to do it properly, it's a whole other world of interest and skill and other things opens up in front of you. So I'm now really, really into that. I don't, I don't do the comp competitive sheepdog trialing where you go and compete against other people. I just have work dogs. I think the truth being that I'm not quite brave enough to go and put myself on public display, but as work dogs, they're very good. Okay, so any question from the gentleman there? Okay, so I think, the, I think the title of the DVD is How to Train Your Sheepdog. <laughs> okay, and the, the author is a guy called Andy Nicholas, which is uh, Andy, N-I-C-K-L-E-S-S. -S. And if you look on Twitter, he's called At Sheepdog Trainer, and almost every, every week he puts on these little demo clips. And he's really good because he shows you different kinds of uh, dogs with different personalities. He's like, okay, if you've got this crazy dog that won't stop barking, this is how you deal with it. If you've got this dog that chases cars, this is how you deal with it. It's good. There are other people as well. I'm not, I have no particular reason to just plug Andy, but he's very good. Ah, okay, so there might be an issue about compatibility with UK DVDs, but yeah. Okay, so you might you just want to be careful to get the right kind of DVD. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, any other questions about sheepdogs? Do we use a whistle? Do we use a whistle? Uh, yeah. Um, a, whistle is, a whistle commands are better than voice commands on a, on a windy mountain. If you want the, the, the command to carry a mile and a half or something across a mountain, you have much more chance with a whistle than, a, than voice commands. They're also much harder. I, the truth is I, I mostly use voice commands. Uh, but then the vast majority of my work is, is within a sort of three quarters of a mile radius from where I'm standing. Some of my friends are professional fell shepherds or mountain shepherds, and they spend like 100 plus days a year gathering fells. And they might have a team of 10 dogs, and maybe five of them go today and five of them go tomorrow, and they sort of alternate them to rest them. But to work those dogs at a distance uh, is usually done by a whistle. And so some of the stuff these dogs, like my dogs are pretty good. They're field dogs and eye dogs. You know what a field dog and an eye dog is? Okay, so f my dogs are bred to be brilliant when they can see the sheep. Okay, they have that border collie thing where they're like, it's like sort of, you know when the Death Star fixes onto a planet in Star Wars? And okay, that's what, that's what my sheepdogs have got. They're, the sheep moves, the, the dog moves to the side and, and it has its eye on them the whole time. Brilliant in, in normal farmland. Uh, but actually to, to do the best work on the mountains, you need a different dog, which does what you tell it when you ask it to go back and back and back. It's traveling back through rocks, it's traveling through bracken, it's going further, there's no sheep in sight. My dogs are starting to freak out at about three quarters of a mile. They're like, why are you asking me to go back? What, what is this? There's no sheep. I can't see any sheep. And they're uncomfortable with that. But a true fell dog, like my friend Joe Weir has, it'll go, if you can keep the command going, it'll go a mile. It'll go a mile and a half. It might even go two miles across the other side of the valley, and it'll still go back. And they, it's not about eye. It's about sort of a different kind of intelligence. And they can hunt out of the bracken or the trees, sheep using their own intelligence and they'll bring them back through like a gully or a ravine without commands, knowing full well that they're in command and they'll bring them back. 
don't, don't tell him about it. If you see this actually in practice, it's most extreme. This is amazing. Like some guy on the other side of the valley is fetching five sheep back off a mountain crag just using a whistle. It's like, gee whiz, that's, don't tell him that I'm, he's one of my best friends. Don't tell him I, I admire that. <laughs> so like the sheep come back after doing the most amazing thing we've seen ever and they'll be like me and my mate stood there going, yeah, all right. <laughs> it's nothing really. Um, <laughs> okay, any more questions about sheepdogs? Okay, so the lady there. Okay, so, so the question is, uh, can they be like pets as well, or is it all business, basically? Um, in, at the moment, Floss is in the house, because she's gonna have puppies. We've put a place next to the fire in the farmhouse kitchen. She's gonna have pups. She doesn't wanna be there one bit. I keep getting messages from my wife saying, she doesn't like being in the house, she's a work dog. Yeah? She really wants to be in the barn. My wife wants to keep an eye on her, so it's like a health thing, like welfare thing, but uh, the truth is they're not, the great work dogs are not necessarily the best of pets. Some of the, they'll have like a cuddle if they've done something really good. Like Joe's dogs are always getting cuddles. He's really soppy with them. But, um, so there's a, there is some love involved, but I think really what they want to do is the work. And uh, so Floss is, when jo various journalists came from the, to the farm when my book came out and they all wanted to like make a fuss of the dogs and the dogs are just like, yeah, whatever. Um, we're, we're not pets. They would they like do the work. So they're just completely ignoring the sort of affection and fuss in a way that a pet dog wouldn't do. Okay. That's right. So, so how do my sort of children interact with the whole sort of learning process with the dogs? Well, my, I've got a slight headache because my daughter B, who's 10 years old, is desperate to be a sheepdog trainer and competitor, I think, and worker anyway. So she's two years ago said, Dad, if we ever have any more puppies, I would like one of them to be mine and I would like to train it and like to learn about it. So the truth is I've got two, two thoughts about that. One is that's really good. My daughter loves the thing to be doing. She wants to learn it and she's smart, so she'll work it out. I'm also a little bit worried because when I was like 10, I got a sheepdog and I, we didn't train it properly. I was like a 10 year old. I didn't get it out, I was at school. It didn't get looked after in a way I'm proud of now. Um, so I think the truth is it'll have to be my dog and her dog because she'll, be, she'll have gone to college in five years or something, won't she? And I'll be left day to day basis working it. But, but yeah, I, I, I'm really, really hoping we get a puppy that's a good worker. We can train it properly. She can get a lot of enjoyment and skill out of that. And, and who knows, she might be Hopefully in 15 years, Sam, she's like 25 years old and a great sheepdog trainer and she's on the mountain doing all this stuff. That would be lovely. Okay. Uh, okay. Actually, this is quite rare. Usually when I go to things like this, one of the first questions somebody asks is, who's looking after the sheep and are you a phony? Pe people are always worried that I'm here. I'm like, if you do this stuff, what are you doing in Iowa? So who's looking after things at home? Um, uh, my wife... Even when I'm at home, does a lot of the management of the farm, like the thinking about the farm and the sort of business side of the farm and the paperwork. She does a lot of that anyway, so she's still there, being, being the sort of boss behind the scenes. I have a friend called Hannah, who's a young shepherdess. She wasn't from a farming background. She was like a marine biologist by education, but um, she fell in love with farming and wanted to be a farmer. And this will make you laugh. I, I wasn't really convinced that people from non-farming backgrounds made as good of farmers as, as the kids that grew up on farms. But she, to be fair, her and a few other people are proving me wrong. Like they come to it with an open mind and loads of respect and hard work and that she's really good basically. Don't, don't tell her I said that either. Let's keep her on her toes. Uh, so she's looking after my sheep at the moment. She goes and um, she'll be there now uh, feeding my sheep, just checking everything's okay. I've obviously done a, lot, done a lot of prep before I came to make it all work okay. And I think the second part of your question was do we ever travel as a family? Um, uh, n yes and no. So I, I, when I was a kid, I, I never went on holiday. I think we had one... I think we had four days in the Isle of Man. Has anybody been to the Isle of Man? No, there's a reason why you haven't been to the Isle of Man. <laughs> it's basically just a, a rainy bit of northern England that's pushed out into the Irish, Irish Ocean. Uh, but anyway, that was the best my parents could do. So we had a four-day holiday. But we, my parents didn't go on holiday when I was a kid. And I was 19 before I even left Britain, which is... Uh, and 20 before I had my first foreign food, food, which was a pizza. How sophisticated were we? Uh, so we did, I didn't grow up traveling, and I kind of, it took me quite a long time to, to get more comfortable with it. I don't know, some of you might be like this, I grew up not liking leaving the farm. I felt like that was, like, one or two of you are nodding, the sort of farmers, it feels wrong, doesn't it? It's like, my job's to look after this place, and some farmers are hopeless at going on holiday. In fact, I know a lot of holidays, uh, farmers that go home on like the second day of their holiday, 
leaving very angry wife and children at the beach somewhere because they just they can't stand being on holiday. So do we, do we travel? Uh, yeah, the truth is, since my, since my book came out, when I get invited to do cool things in other places, I try occasionally to take my wife and kids with me. Um, it's getting harder as we have more kids. So uh, four kids is going to be a nightmare to take like, to Australia or something, isn't it? But um, yeah, so we try to. And I, t I try really hard to do what my mum and dad couldn't afford to do, which was to like, have a, one week of holiday a year where I put my kids first. Um, I like staying at home, but there's always something distracting me. There's like a dog thing or a sheep thing or a farm thing that I need to think about. So I'm not always uh, as fully focused as a dad as I might be. So I try to make that one week of the year where I'm just d dad that plays in the swimming pool and does all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. What breed of sheepdogs do we, do we use? We use well, the, the eye dogs and the field dogs. They're quite, far, quite purebred uh, border collies. Yeah. They're brilliant at the eye thing. Uh, the fell dogs are often more crossbred. They often have strains of other things in them. They sometimes even have a little bit of hound in them. So when you see them on a mountainside among the bracken or whatever, hunting sheep out of the bracken, that's some of the hound instinct that's been bred into them. So they call them cur dogs, is the sort of dialect word for them where we are. And there's more. The other thing that the fell dog can do, which the border collie can't do, is... Uh, a border collie will give you, might give you an hour, might give you two hours, might even give you three hours of really good work. But if, if there's any heat at all, it's starting to get tired. These fell dogs can work into this like sixth hour, the seventh hour, the eighth hour, and then get up again and do it the next day. So there's like a hybrid vigor in some of the crossbred dogs that there isn't in the border collie. One last question about dogs. Oh, the guy at the back. Um, so I think everybody heard that. So uh, do you need a lot of land, basically, to, to be fair to a border collie and, and keep it busy? I think the issue is not how much land you have, but how much time you spend with the dog doing the thing that it's programmed to do. So some of the best sheepdog trainers are, are small farmers who have a tiny amount of land, but they're, they're making sure that the dog gets its whatever it is. So like a three, four-month-old, five-month-old dog maybe only needs 15 or 20 minutes work a day. Maybe it needs an hour of outside play or two hours of outside play. That's the essential bit. When it's a year old, a year and a half old, it might need, it might be up to doing two hours work a day. So it's, it's just making sure that they have that time. I think the, the, the saddest thing I see is when people get, get a really intelligent, hyper-tuned in border collie, and the, you know, the, because their life's busy or whatever, it doesn't have anything to think about most of the time. So I think the real decision with a border collie is whether you, whether you can be fair to it, whether you can give it the stimulation it needs. I think sometimes it's possible to juggle. Coming back to the pet question, if you can spend two hours a day playing ball with your dog, yeah, he's like throwing the ball and he gets to fetch it back or you're doing some agility or whatever, and you only do 15 minutes sheep work, that's, that's probably okay. So it's, it's about having the amount of exercise and the amount of intellectual stimulation that they need. Go on, one, one more quick one about the dogs. Lady there. Okay. <coughs> okay, so... Basically, where do the dogs live and what's, how, how to sort of manage where they're at and where they're not at. Some people, I, about two years ago, I put a picture on Twitter of my dogs in their kennels. Okay? All of my follow, followers are horrified. The first tweet said, they're in jail. Because my, my dog pens, I think they're good dog pens. They're really expensive dog pens. They're, they look a little bit like a jail. They've got the sort, of, uh, the sort of jail bars that go around them, but they're big open pens where they can exercise in and move around. But to people that weren't used to the idea that my dogs at night went into their kennels, this was horrific. I'd put them in jail. Um, so the do my dogs on a good day spend like four or five hours with me, working, following me do while I do what I do, doing the thing that needs to happen with the stray sheep. Then they spend the rest of the time in those pens. They can move around. They can, and they can talk to each other through the rails because they're next to each other. So um, I think they get most of their... Uh, most of the attention that they need and stuff is because they're next to their mother and their father and they're, they're talking to each other through the bars and stuff. And they can move around even if I'm busy that day and I can, I can only spend half an hour with them or something. Okay. So, um, managing, sorry, sheep health is the next one. So, just to give you a really quick idea of how we manage the sheep health, we, I've kind of bought into a lot of the latest science on sheep, which is historically we used to pump into them whatever we thought we needed to in terms of chemical injection, antibiotic, to cure whatever ailment that they had. So we used to use an ophthalmic wormer on our sheep about once every six weeks all year round. It's incredible with hindsight. That was like 30 years ago. That was like normal. We was pumping this stuff in. They're a little bit wormy. 
slightest sign of a dirty backside. You worm all 500 cheap. It's like, I can't believe we did it now. We've, we've moved on to the, the, the more modern thinking about this is to really target any treatments, uh, not treat unless you're absolutely certain that they need it. Um, and many of the problems that we have from lameness through to scouring to, to susceptibility to pneumonia and other things appear to have a genetic element. So we now keep super detailed records about uh, the problems that we have with, with, with the sheep and then we can start to judge based on the genetics on the different families. Are they particularly prone to lameness? In which case we get rid of them, sell them to somebody else, sell them for meat, whatever it would be. Um, and I think that's had a huge effect. And I think the other thing that's I've really focused on in the last couple of years is isolating animals with problems very quickly. So a lot of the lameness problems and scarring problems, uh, I try to catch them absolutely on the first day and get that sheep out of the flock into, into isolation. And, and I'm finding that's having a massive effect. So basically what's happening is a sheep with foot rot or one of the various different foot conditions is walking around the meadow like, like, like a sort of stamp, putting this thing right across the meadow. And it's inevitable that all the other sheep are walking across that and picking up the problems. So my big sort of breakthrough that's improved things in the last couple of years has been about uh, isolation. In the five or ten years before that, it's been very much about reducing the amount of chemicals and interventions that we do. Um, and the really amazing thing has been uh, that I think we were using a lot of those, that stuff unnecessarily. So a lot of the wormer particularly we just, didn't, just wasn't needed. Um, and what we tend to do now is even if there is a sheep which I think is worms, uh, wormed, I will treat the one that has visible signs of worms. I don't treat the other 500 uh, unless it's a really sort of bad situation. So we're down to now maybe only once or twice a year using a wormer on our sheep and we time it very carefully. Okay, I'm going to throw this out to questions quite early. Has anybody got any questions about sort of sheep health or, sheep or flock management? No, that must have been much more boring. Uh, okay, so the question is, do we feed, uh, what's the sort of feeding regime to the, sheep, to the sheep? So we've gone back, as I said last night, we've gone back to an older way of farming with the native breeds to minimize the inputs that we put in. So 30 years ago, with a more lowland breed, more product, productive and efficient breed, uh, it was in the wrong place. It's on this slightly hard farm in the middle of nowhere. You're pumping in bought feed, you're having to use more medicines and all the rest of it. So as we've gone back to the native breeds, um, we, sorry, we've gone back to the native breeds, we also keep the flock very young. The truth is on hard country, in a mountain country, you, you, you cull the flock and keep it as young as possible, selling your, your, your older females down the hill to other people. So the combination of uh, those two things has enabled us to really minimize the amount of feed that we do. So next week, we pregnancy scan the, the ewes. One of my friends is a sort of ultra scanner. What do they call it? It's not ultra scanning. It's ultrasound, of course it is. Uh, so my friend Joel come to the farm. The, the ones with one lamb in, uh, will be separated out. I probably will only give them hay through the through winter. They can hold their condition fine. Uh, some of them with twins, particularly any that are uh, in poorer condition or slightly older, I'll get a, give a bite of bought feed to. And really one of my business goals is to cut the bought feed thing as, down as far as I can. So people are a little confused. People think when you breed sheep, you would want to have the maximum number of lambs. But actually when my sheep have more than one lamb, it, it actually brings a whole bunch of costs and problems for me. They can't go back to the mountains because it's too hard in the summer, so I need more lowland grazing, and I need to buy more feed. So it's less about productivity, it's less about sort of maximizing yield and more about making a margin on the bit that you do produce, if that makes sense. Okay. Any more questions about sort of sheep? Uh, sorry, lady in the, sorry, the lady there. Okay, so the, the, the question that you can't hear is about why do, why do I sheep have teal, uh, tails when a lot of sheep sort of in the US and, US and elsewhere don't have tails, have dock tails. Uh, in the UK, uh, mountain sheep have tails, L lowland sheep don't have tails. Okay, so this isn't a judgment about whether docking's right or wrong. Uh, lowland sheep uh, are on better nutrition, which actually is not something sheep are used to. They're, they're, the sheep originally came from the Middle East, from poorer land, places like... Um, uh, sort of mountain places like mountainous places like Georgia and uh, where it's sort of dusty, dry, poor nutrition. So they're not really suited to better ground, which means that their feet grow too quickly, uh, they scour more often, and that's uh, and then you get problems with the scour with fly strike, which is the flies laying, laying their eggs on, and then you get maggots. So 
So docking on lowland good ground is a good way to manage some of those issues of sheep being on slightly too good a ground, to be blunt. Uh, in the mountain country, uh, the nutrition is much worse. So my mountain sheep never scour. So I don't have problems with fly strike, which require me to lose the tail. And the conditions are so bad that the original function of the tail, which is to keep the bag uh, protected from the wind and to keep the back end of the sheep warm, is actually still needed. So the reasons for docking I don't have and the reasons for having a tail I do have. So, so mountain sheep in our landscape keep their tail. Uh, lowland sheep don't. So there's something else I should explain about how we farm sheep in the UK. So the mountains are the, have been for a very, very long time into history the nursery for the national sheep flock. So what happens with a lot of the mountain sheep is that you put a lowland terminal sire onto the, um, onto the mountain ewe and the offspring from that becomes uh, the, the male offspring goes into the meat trade. The daughter becomes the breeding ewe for the, the lowlands of England. So in the autumn each year, and if you ever come to England, do it in the autumn and go to the sheep sales in the north of England. It's amazing. Um, people from Kent, from Somerset, from below London, uh, for generations have travelled from their farms each September and October to buy these uh, ewe lambs from the fells. It's called the harvest of the fells. And... Uh, so that's what's going on. So coming back to the tail thing, those daughters of the sheep on the mountains are docked because we know they're going to go when they're adults to the lowland and live on the lowland farm. The mothers keep their tail. So you see what I mean? It's, it's to do with the situation. I think there was one more question about sheep health from somebody in a black jacket further back. Okay, yeah. So I'm not making any kind of moral judgment about docking sheep, sheep's tails. This is purely practical. On my mountain, it's better with tails. Um, get less mastitis and other problems like that because the, the tail's doing the job it was intended to do. Okay. That's a good question. How do we know when we're going to sell an old ewe? Well, the traditional pattern in these mountains is that the sheep, believe it or not, didn't lamb until they were three years old, okay, for the first time. They then lambed one, sorry, they lambed two or three times on the mountain and went back to the mountain with their lamb. And then when they were, so basically five or six years old, they were all sold to the lowlands. They're called draft ewes. So those farmers didn't have enough what we call in-by land, which is the good ground in the valley bottom, the meadows. You couldn't keep the sheep there all summer. Um, so the whole flock was turned over at the age of five or six, and a lot of the flocks still do that now. Because I breed uh, pedigree sheep, and I'm trying to maximize the, the really strong bloodlines in my flock and minimize the really weak ones, I do keep... If one's a particularly, uh, particularly good ewe that breeds particularly well, I keep it past that point, and I do look after it on the lowlands until she's older. So some of my sheep are 10 or 12 years old. I have a friend who, uh, it's hard to believe, I, I even find it hard to believe, but I know it's true because he's an honourable person. I had a ewe that lived until it was 20 years old. He took it down the hill, he kept it on lower ground, and, which tells you something, doesn't it? They're, and the amazing thing about these mountain sheep is that they adjust their fertility to the land that they're on. So my mountain sheep come off the mountain and they basically put up le less eggs than they would if they were on better ground in the lowlands. So those draft ewes that are five or six years old which go to the lowlands have been having one lamb each on average in the mountains when they were young. When they go to the lowlands, they get better nutrition and they start having twins. Which is amazing, isn't it? They're like, they just adjust to the environment they're in. I think it's really smart. Okay, any more questions about sheep flock health? Um, the second part, the, the latter part of that. So basically, when those old ewes go to the lowland, they would have a higher risk of scouring because they're on better nutrition, but the truth is the people know about them and they farm them on quite hard, uh, quite a hard way, quite, uh, quite a lot of them to the acre. They wouldn't let them have sort of huge amounts of grass and scour. Um, so yeah, that slightly contradicts what I said about the tails earlier, but that's just part of the system and people manage it. This gentleman? Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, do we have predators on the mountains? So, so no, about 500 years ago, the last wolf in England was killed. Um, and that's a very hot political topic in the UK. There are lots of people who want to restore areas of wilderness in the UK and uh, bring back those large predators. There are even some people that want to bring back the large herbivores, which no longer exist. That's quite interesting. But they want to bring back, pro they want to bring back proxies for them, want to bring back potentially bison, 
Uh, there's even been talk of elephants and things like that because there would have been things like elephants once in our landscape, which is quite incredible. But um, with that... Without getting into that too, too much, um, we don't have the problems you have with large predators. And the, what happened there? Doesn't matter, let's just ignore that. Um, so what's happened in the last 500 years is that our traditions and practices have evolved to not have to worry about large predators. And whether it's right or wrong in the long run to have those large predators back, I'll leave to other people to decide. But if they come back, it means a really profound shift in the shepherding practices and the way that we did things. Because um, the last time there, was, there were wolves there, A, there weren't very many, for the, but when there were a significant number, you had people with the sheep all the time. Whereas in our model at the moment, you can leave those sheep on the mountain unsupervised for quite lengthy periods of time if you need to. So I'm not sure anybody wants to go back to the, the shepherding model of 800 years ago with somebody who lives on the mountain all the time. I, I don't know how that's going to work out. T time will tell. Okay. Yeah. So, so we have a massive issue in the UK with uh, tuberculosis in cattle and we have a really, really hot sort of political topic about that because uh, many people in the farming community think that uh, one of the, the biggest causes of that is, ba is badgers and other wild animals passing TB around, bringing it to bet transmitting it between herds. Clearly people that care about badgers and, and, and ecology find that really problematic and there's a whole debate about whether the badgers should be culled and whether that's a viable way to control the disease. Um, the truth is we, we test for TB peri periodically. We're also absolutely crawling in badgers and foxes. We have a landscape that's full of uh, the remaining predators in England. I, I, the truth is I don't know what to think about it. I, the, the science is complicated about whether culling is the answer. So, yeah. I think, well, I, I, th I think the point is that by, by controlling TB as strictly as we do, we maintain the trading arrangements we have whereby we're c other countries believe that we're not going to spread it to them. So it's all about our trading status, I, th I think. But I, I know there are some people that think we'll never win that battle, that it's impossible to eradicate TB and it's very costly to manage it. So we're into really murky water about what the, so the what solution is. And it's actually one of the few complicated issues on Twitter that I tend not to dive into because I'm not quite sure what I think is the honest, on, honest answer. I have a lot of respect for my farming friends who were really troubled by this and been put out of business in, it in, in some ways, but I'm, I'm not quite sure what the answer is or what the science says. I mean, the, the, the context for this is that Britain's a tiny island, very full of people, all owned, all managed in a very, very intensive way. We were the first industrial, or one of the first industrial nations. Um, there's that 10,000 years worth of history. So all of these deb debates are super intense with us. So we have an increasingly urban population who are, and I shouldn't use any kind of judgmental language about this, deeply love their countryside, care, read about it in the newspaper every day, worry about any kind of threat to it would like it to be better for birds and insects and all the rest of it. And in the midst of that, there's all these farmers like me trying to, trying to navigate that really, uh, trying to not fall, like, fall foul of the public. Try, and the badger thing falls into that. So even if, even if culling badgers is the best way to deal with the disease, it's so unpopular with the British public. And so it's such a sort of PR disaster that it's, it's a bit of a nightmare. It's like, whoa, um, do we do what the farmers need us to do to manage the disease? at the risk of alienating the entire British public, I, who, who knows? Um, complicated. I think some of these things don't have, don't have easy answers, do they? They're just difficult. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, so the annual... Uh, um, the annual things that we give to all of our sheep are we give them, uh, do you use Heptavac here? No, so the brand name's different here, but uh, we're basically using a, like a seven in one vaccination for all of the lambs where they have two pricks six weeks apart when they're young. Um, 
there's some coverage, short-term coverage for pneumonia in that as well. I recently discovered it's only three months worth of coverage, isn't that? But, uh, so I was very disappointed to discover that. Um, uh, we also scratch them for a disease called ORF, which is like the scabby disease on their lips that can, is very, sort of passes. Yeah. Um, so apart from that, not, not a huge amount. Uh, some of our friends vaccinate for some of the uh, um, sort of miscarriage uh, abortion bugs that, that are around. We haven't been troubled by those and so far I've resisted doing that. And we're, we're toying with the idea of um, uh, what's called foot vax with us, which is the foot rot vaccination scheme, uh, which is quite expensive. But um, I think if I've, if I've understood it, I'm not an expert on this, I'm not a vet, but I, if I've understood it correctly, the current thinking is that most of the foot problems in sheep start out in the same way as something that we've always called foot rot. And then they can evolve in different ways into the, the different foot conditions. So being able to stop that first stage in the process, potentially through a vaccination, would be really important. But I have to say, um, the way we manage our sheep is really, really instructive to me in what's going on. So the mountain sheep, A, never get scoured. I very, very rarely ever have a lame sheep on the mountain. They, they, what's happening is that the mountain sheep spread out over a bigger area of land, which I think is more like what sheep probably were used to in the wild. And because they're not trample, eat, eating grass that each other has trampled or defecated on or whatever, the worm transmission is much lower, the, the footness. I think many, many of the problems we've got is that we've, it was when you sort of, as, as, lo as lots of you will know, when you start to farm animals more intensively in smaller spaces, that's when you get much more disease transmission, and then you need much, much, much more interventions and much more uh, sort of chemical solutions. Okay. Sorry, do we ever trim the hooves? Yeah, okay, so that's another thing that's changed. So one of the jobs I had to do when I was 15 years old was we would maybe twice a year almost trim every sheep's foot on the farm. Yeah, so it's like a 15-year-old, I'm turning like 500 sheep over over like a two-day period, trimming their feet. And having really neat, short feet was, was the thing that we thought was a good idea. And then all of the time through the rest of the year, we'd be going through pulling off any that had longer feet and trimming those. It was a huge amount of work. The latest thinking is that you should barely do any foot trimming. Um, that uh, it isn't something you should do. And the fact that we were doing it was leading to some of the other problems. So we used to, what we'd call, look at little red proud uh, lumps of flesh on the end of the feet and I went to a talk by this amazing foot sh sheep hoof scientist lady about five years ago and she said stop cutting the hooves anything like as short as you have done and those things will disappear overnight and it was one of those moments where you think I wonder if she's right or this is just some person that knows more than they think we do and I went home and I, we did exactly what she said and we've barely ever had one of those problems with proud flesh out the hoof since so it's like a practice we developed and got stuck in which wasn't the right thing to do so you listen to it and you change uh, we cull on sheep that have pr permanent foot problems. That's a heartbreaker if it's your best you. And it's like, oh God, she's the best you I've got, but I have to keep doing her feet every six months or something, or six weeks. Um, so we do very little foot trimming. Uh, there is one of the f uh, foot conditions at the moment called CDD, which is pretty horrible. It means that the hoof sort of separates from the foot and, and it's very manky and it falls off. Uh, those ones, I think probably you do have to chop the hoof off and begin the process of it healing. You put antibiotics on, and, but we try to do as little foot trimming as we can now. Okay, so I'm going to go to that guy and then I'm going to go to that, that hand at the back. Thank you. Okay, so. The, 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 big, the big new idea in my, in my sort of wider community, wider landscape, is rotational grazing. And I've got friends that are really, really into that and uh, moving their sheep through the sort of set paddocks on a very regular basis. And, and can, they're getting amazing results in terms of how many sheep you can keep on a piece of land. And um, yeah, in terms of the grassland management, it looks really smart and it looks like an answer to a lot of our problems. So that is going on. The ability to do it on our, in our old system is quite, quite limited. Um, so the answer is, I, the truth is, I don't do a lot of that, but I'd, I was brought up and I, and I still absolutely believe that sheep like being on a fresh paddock periodically. So we talk about sheep going stale. So what, what I find quite often with people that, people that keep sheep for the first time or keep sheep on a small holding is that they quite often keep the sheep in the same field indefinitely. And it isn't a question of them starving, they're, they're perfectly well fed, but our sheep, our sheep, we like them either to be on the fell, where they're finding grass that's fresh and untouched, or, or we rotate them through the, we basically do rotational grazing, but we don't call it that. We would rotate them after, 
And what, what's the old saying? We had a saying in our area, which was that the sheep should never be in the same field um, to hear the, the church bells twice. They should never have been in there more than two weeks. Yeah. Get them out of there, move them into the next one, let that one recover. So maybe we do rotational grazing, but we don't, we don't call it that. Okay, and then get the back. Okay. Okay, so this is a question about the foot and mouth disease. Um, one of the saddest, well, some of the saddest things that's ever happened to me, so one of the saddest things in my book was I wrote about um, in 2001, uh, we had an absolute disaster in our country, which was called foot and mouth disease. Uh, both, of my, uh, both of the farms that we had um, lost all of our animals on, uh, at that time. Luckily, the flock of mountain sheep that I've been telling you about over the last 24 hours at that time belonged to my neighbor, and they were the last piece of land that was not taken out in the cull to prevent the disease. So they survived, and I, I took them on after that time. Um, so foot and mouth, utterly horrific disease. Um, completely mismanaged when it happens. So basically, if you get foot and mouth disease, you need to shut everything, shut movements of animals down very, very quickly and ruthlessly. You probably need to isolate the place where it's happened. There probably needs, well, from, from the science I've seen, there probably needs to be a sort of a, a cull area around that and you clean that out and you've sterilized the situation and it's over. So at the moment, we don't have any foot and mouth disease of any kind. It was eventually defeated. But the problem was that they didn't, isolate, they didn't realize what was happening quickly enough. So you have a very urban government that doesn't really understand livestock movements and how they happen in our landscape. And by the time they did, 10 days had passed and all of the auctions had continued, all of the sheep sales had continued. You've got this, if, you, if you'd done a sort of digital map of where sheep had moved in then 10 days, they'd gone everywhere. So they spent the next six months trying to catch up with where the disease had gone and, and kill it. Uh, at that time we had nearly 200 cattle, because I, I didn't complicate this before, but we had another farm near to the farm that I live on now, and there were 200 cattle on that, and this is pretty grim, but the, we went in the morning and one of the cows had it. So it's basically a disease that makes the, the, the cow slaver in the mouth. There's lots of like, uh, like spit coming out the mouth. And as soon as we saw it, I'd never seen it before, but I, my dad and I said, look, that's, that looks like foot and mouth. Let's get these cows in. You take them down to the farmstead, get them in. We called the vet. He had one look. Um, what amazed me was how quickly it develops. So a cow that had a little bit of saliva in the morning, Two hours later, by the time the vet was looking at it and we were in, going through the process, uh, was starting to blister all around its mouth. It's pretty, pretty horrid. Um, um, and basically, the vet has to convince the powers that be in, in the city that you have the disease, and then they killed all of our animals, which I've never been part of anything more horrific in all my life. Um, my dad couldn't face that, so my dad, my dad went into the house, just wanted nothing to do with it. And I was, I was quite young at that time, and, and I was... Uh, sort of left dealing with all these random people. They wanted, we had a lot of wild cattle, like uh, what we would call suckler cattle that rear their own calves and live on the rough ground. And they wanted to put these cattle into these flimsy little aluminium pens to slaughter them. And I, I, I forget how old I was in 2001, but um, I said to these guys that this is not gonna work. These cattle will destroy this pen. And they didn't listen, didn't listen to me, they must have thought I was too young or something. Uh, so they tried once, the, the pen just exploded in all directions and the cattle ran around the field. So then they had to have a meeting about how to kill our cattle, and I still can't believe this happened. They had to go and get a police marksman, a sniper, and he spent the next six or seven hours killing our cattle in the fields where they lived. Uh, this is with a motorway, the M6 motorway going past one part of the field, the A6 and the mainline, uh, mainline railway going through the other side, and in a village with several hundred people in, most of whom were stood on the village green in tears, in like this weird apocalyptic scene where all the animals in the fields around their farm were being killed by a man with a rifle. I mean, there were moments that day where I could not believe what I was seeing was real. So how do you, how do you stop that happening? I, to be perfectly honest, I've forgotten. I, uh, the truth is, I've forgotten what the thing was that started for mouth disease. I think it was feeding, don't quote me on this, I think it was feeding uh, sort of uh, food from Chinese takeaways that had been imported that hadn't been properly treated was carrying the disease. So this ended up back into the, the pigs on a pig farm, if I remember right, but don't quote me on this. So there were a bunch of lousy, cheap food practices that basically started this thing off in the first place. And those are illegal. They shouldn't have even happened then, but they've been really clamped, on, clamped down on since then. So uh, yeah, so I guess it's just a horrible warning about disease transmission and uh, not just once it started, but uh, transmission of diseases in the first place and what kind of stuff you let into your country. And, um, yeah, 
So a huge, huge thing. And everything I've shown you in the last 24 hours about this amazing histor historic farming system, the disease, the foot and mouth disease, stopped, in some cases, about two or three fields away from the mountains. And because the mountains are unfenced, if the disease had got onto the mountain, game over. Everything I've shown you, everything on those photographs, all of the way that farming happens, finished forever. Those flocks that go to the mountain, nothing left. So I look back at it now, and I, just, I, I can't believe how close this all came to ending. So, uh, lady in the, the red jumper? Good. Okay. Okay, so what, what do we eat? Um, well, I'm a vegetarian. Um, you don't believe that, I'm not. Uh, I had to laugh. For, for, for those of you that don't, don't like bad language, just cover your ears for a moment. I had to laugh. I was watching a cooking pro program one night where uh, Gordon Ramsay was asked in the kitchen what the vegetarian option was. And he said, vegetarian option? It's bugger off. <laughs> uh, which perhaps reflects the darker person inside me. But uh, um, no, the truth is I, I, I really, really firmly believe in eating as locally produced food as you can when you can. I think that's really, really important. You cut down the food miles and the carbon and all the rest of it. And I, I trust the food from my own landscape. You, know, you start fetching stuff in packets from somewhere else. I don't really know who produced it. I don't really know whether I agree with how they did it. So uh, we try to eat as much of our own lamb as possible. And uh, we can obviously only produce so many things in that landscape. So I can't produce pak choy and Chinese vegetables and things to have a Chinese meal. But we try and eat as much of our own produce as possible. And, uh, and we try and do that in as hands-on way of, as possible. I, th I think if you're going to eat, you've got to face up to what it really means, haven't you? So the killing of the animal, the skinning of the animal, try and become involved in all of that and, to, and therefore try and respect what we're, we're eating as much as we possibly can. So we eat quite a bit of meat. Um, the truth is, until I was 20, we lived on potatoes and, and stew and mince. Yeah, like, like proper European peasants. And in the last 25, 30 years, that's changed into eating a bit more like everybody else. So we'll have noodles, we'll have fajitas or whatever it is. Um, so we, we eat a whole bunch of different things now. But um, I know I've got to finish in a moment. One of the best things I've done recently is I've got a friend called Ivan Day, who's a food historian. He lives near to where I live. Amazing guy. He's like the go-to guy for every TV producer in the world when they make a program about Edwardian food or how they ate in Norman castles. He's, he's like done the research, he's got the tools, he's got the knives and all the rest of it. So he invited us to dinner about five months ago, four months ago now, and I provided him with a, a Herdwick sheep, and his mission was to cook this how they used to cook it in the old-fashioned farmhouses. And I, I didn't really know what that meant, but we picked up, pictured up, his, up at his house, he has the old-fashioned farmhouse stove, right? With the coal banked up in the front of it. He has all of the old machinery, which you, you wind up, and then the weight comes down, and the meat, the, the leg of lamb that I gave him is turning in front of the fire. And uh, the historic breeds have more fat than the lowland breeds. It's better fat, but the fat is there for a reason. If you're buying the leanest meat you can in a supermarket, you're a muppet, because the food is, uh, the, the, the fat in meat is there for a reason to give it the flavor. Yeah? So when you saw it cooked the traditional way, you could see why, because this thing's turning around all the time, and, it, and th that good fat is basting it and making it the most delicious juice meat you've ever, juicy meat you've ever tasted in your life. And beneath it was a potato cake, and the, the dripping from the meat was dripping to form a crust on top of the potato cake. Um, next up, he, he makes something which I've never seen before in my life, which is, and I forget which way around it was, but he made hover cakes and uh, clap cakes. Now, a hover cake is like a... What do you call the Mexican, um, uh, yeah, that you sort of break, the cardboardy ones that you break? Is that tortilla? It's what? It's, yeah, like the taco. Um, so he makes like this, uh, our version of the taco, which is a sort of, um, sort of oatmeal, sort of cr crusty biscuit thing, and you, and you break a bit of this, you put some of the lamb on the top, you put a little bit of chutney or reserve on the top, and you taste it, amazing. But even better were the other things he made, which I think were the clap cakes. And they're like a pancake, like a japati, yeah? And, it, and the same thing again, you, you, the old way was that you put them in your hand, you put some of the lamb, you, it's like, it was like Indian food. Um, and I've never even seen this. So I'm this guy that wrote a book about how great our farming system is and the, how marvelous the lamb is that we had. I've never even seen it cooked properly till I'm at this house. And I kid you not, I have never tasted better meat in my life than what he did with that, that leg of lamb of ours. And it's got me thinking, because I'm thinking, hang on a minute, we're not selling this right, we're not cooking it right, we're not telling people how to do this. So I'm on a bit of a mission at the moment to work out how, where we go with this. Maybe one of my kids can be the person that 
puts that back on the map, I don't know. Um, the other thing that he's doing, I gave him four legs. The other three, he's curing in the old fashioned way. So in our landscape, they have these big farmhouse chimneys, okay? And in October at the start of winter, when you had this glut of the lambs coming off the mountain, actually it wasn't the lambs, it was the three and four year old males. We used to keep them till the three or four years old because the, the best lamb in the world, the best mutton is older. Uh, they would kill four, five, six, eight of these things and then smoke dry them or air dry them in the chimney. And it was like a kind of parma ham. Um, they would put sort of various, rub various things in every day. And then all winter long, you would carve, carve off these little slivers of mutton that was like parma ham. And they still do it in, I forget what they call it, they still do it in Norway. They have it with berries, they have it with bread. Amazing way to eat mutton and lamb. And this guy's doing that for me at the moment, and he's going to fetch these, these other three legs back to, to our place. And I'm going to spend the rest, of, rest, the rest of winter experimenting in how good this is. The only thing I didn't tell you about this meat was, historically, the meat off these Herdwick sheep was considered to be the best mutton in the world. So when the Queen had a coronation in the, what was that, late 1940s, around there sometime, um, the, the best meat that they, they could serve anybody was Herdwick mutton. So that's what they did. They served Herdwick mutton at the coronation. And sadly, over the following decades, it, it ended up where the only people eating mutton were uh, quite often the British Asian community. So the older ewes that we sell, when they get really old and they go into the food chain, it's probably some of the best meat in Britain, and it's only eaten by people in the British Asian community who know how to cook mature meat properly and put the spices in and do all the exciting things with it. So if you ever have a curry in England, you're probably eating Herdwick meat from the mountains. I've got to shut up now. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.